Um, you know, Marco has just been great to deal with right from the start. He said yes instantly, um, and we're very lucky to have him with us tonight. He's a Sardinian born and bred, so he knows the plants, the conditions, the climate, the places of that island, and I think he'll show us some of that. He's, as a landscaper, been uh, building resilient gardens that work in those conditions, and that will be useful to hear about. And latterly, as a PhD student at uh, uh, the University of Sheffield, he has been conducting a more experimental um, science-based uh, uh, approach to finding out how we can, as he calls it, reduce input levels. So what are input levels? Um, that's the number of plants that you put into the ground to start with, the, the amount of water that you give them, the amount of maintenance that you supply, and then the number of plants you have to replace, which and I think that, you know, that's something we're all doing in, in, in our gardens. And I think it'll be fantastic to learn um, how these, uh, science, these uh, experiments um, are going and what, what what's, uh, Marco has learned from um, them. Um, if you can all stay mute for the length of the presentation, please. That'll be about 45 minutes. We will then obviously have questions either from the chat or if you, in your reactions, you will see a little way that your yellow hand comes up and that actually pops you up to the front of the gallery. So if you'd like to talk, then that's a, that, that will work. And um, I think that's all from me, except to say a huge welcome to Marco Scano. Grazie mille per essere con noi. Siamo molto privilegiati. Thank you. Thank you. Sono contenta di vedere che ci sono 73. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So more and more coming through. That's fantastic. Um, if you would now like to share your screen. Yeah, sure. And then we can begin. Everyone will see it, the presentation better if you choose speaker view. Okay. Looking good. Yeah. Can you see the screen? Yeah. Okay. Perfect, Marco. Grazie. Thank you. Thank you for presentation. It's a good photo. <laughs> yeah, so, so. I was done recently. <laughs> <South Africa. laughs> uh, okay, thanks for having me here. And uh, uh, I'm Marco Scano, I'm uh, from Sardinia, and uh, I'm an agronomist, so I don't have an architectural background, uh, but more a horticulture and uh, I, I was I specialized in plant pathology and pest control and uh, I now run my my own company after having worked uh, a bit in California for not not long but mainly in my in my family nursery and then I started my landscaping company uh, almost at the same time and and I still grow some plants that uh, I consider more useful to my to my company uh, instead of buying exclusively from nursery nursery market, and uh, so for uh, of course I will I will drive you in a beautiful tour of uh, through Sardinia to see what what could be what I consider really inspiring for me, and uh, so I think many of you know where Sardinia is. Maybe somewhere someone is not from Europe, so Sardinia is located in the western side of the Mediterranean between Spain and Italy. Uh, what would you notice for sure driving through Sardinia is the presence of this uh, huge tower, megalithic tower there from Bronze Age, from a uh, typical civilization, which was unique of Sardinia almost. And uh, there are many, many types, uh, depending as well from uh, soil fertility. Uh, this is the biggest one, which was excavated at, the, at in the first decade, decades of the, of the 19th century. And uh, is, it, it was a pretty populated area. So it was the, the south of Sardinia, which was really fertile and it still is actually. And it was the, the land that made Sardinia known by the Romans as the, the granary of Rome. So wheat was the main production. It, it is located in the south, more or less up to Cagliari, which is the main city. So the landscape is quite similar to sometimes to Italy mainland, 
uh, with a lot of arable uh, crops. And uh, as well, some vegetables are grown here, uh, like the, the artichoke, the Sardinian artichoke, which is quite similar to the wild one, uh, which is spiky. So this is another interesting rage that is, more, is located in the, central, in the center of the island where the, the, uh, the, the sheep raising is more important. It's still volcanic soils, more or less here. Uh, while if moving the geology changes radically moving toward the east of the island, which is the center and where the Supramonte is. And it's a really interesting location in terms of botanical diversity, biodiversity, uh, lots of gorges and it's essentially limestone and limestone plateau interrupted by huge gorges that reaches the sea. That's uh, another Nurage uh, and that's in this uh, wood, it's, it's a, remnant of the primary uh, wood, uh, oak, home oak wood, Quercus ilex. Uh, so this is in, in the gorges, uh, small rivers, they reach the sea, small streams sometimes, and, uh, and in the riverbed, you can, there's a spontaneous a natural oleander, uh, and, uh, and some engenistic ethnicities is as well endemic. Uh, the man was present in this uh, really uh, harsh environment with uh, practicing pastoral, uh, transhuman pastoralism, using these uh, pastures uniquely during summertime uh, with ex extremely interesting species like this uh, the thyme, the Muserva varona, which uh, was known to, to maintain the flock uh, healthy during the old year. And uh, this is another example of mountain garrigue uh, in an unusual uh, rainy July, where this uh, teucrum, this germander was, was flowering. And so you can see the, the, the landscape is quite moonlight landscape, but this is a really interesting botanical hotspot where a botanist from the Reino di Sardegna from Piedmont found a lot of exclusive species like 20 endemic species plus six exclusive of these few uh, thousand square meter, like this Centaura, for example, which uh, help us to move north as this uh, other Centaura uh, was, uh, gave a hybrid population, this islet, which is more north, is a, is a limestone islet, but it's north here, more or less, in the region where I live, which is Galura. And it's like an island inside the island, which is uh, extremely granitic. So big boulders characterize the landscape, uh, like these hills, which is like, like an entire boulder itself. And uh, Nurage are, are as well present, but uh, population was, was of course uh, much less because the, the soil fertility was much lower. And uh, uh, dry stone walls characterize as well the landscape because the land was uh, privatized in, in 1700 and, uh, and the land was divided by dry stone walls. This is a specimen of uh, wild olive tree, which is uh, one of the oldest in, uh, probably the oldest one in Europe. And the a flag habit of the cork oak is quite typical because it's, ex it's an extremely windy region. Uh, the men used to stay, the population used to stay here uh, consistently during the year. And uh, in these small farms, sub sub sufficient, self sufficient. Uh, so they were able to survive actually because the land was pretty, uh, pretty uh, unproductive. And so the, the economy is based, was based, well, it's still based actually on, on the cork industry. So these are uh, cork uh, during the shipment from the front wood uh, to the industries, to the factories. And uh, this was the economy until the 60s when uh, the uh, Qatar prince Aga Khan uh, built the first uh, the first touristic structure, infrastructure, and uh, an extremely wealthy tourism started. And at the same time, the, the gardening industry became a prominent section of the economy. So, but 
in my opinion, with a, uh, always following a stereotype, which is the, the, the garden, uh, which is uniquely alone, as you can see from this picture where uh, lot where extensive loan dominate landscape and in, at, to my advice they contrast with the natural macchia and this is an, a, another extremely unfortunate piece of peninsula where there is a, this extremely luxurious hotel and you can see the garden is uh, substantially alone so in these last uh, in this last season, we have we had to face extreme temperature other than uh, uh, severe drought. So you can see uh, Quercus ilex, this especially uh, young Quercus ilex dying actually in, in, the, in the environment. And uh, water restriction are, uh, happens historically, but now are probably more, much more, much more probable for the climate change. And, uh, so this is one of my, so now we, we, I'll show you some of my gardens. And these are convinced the client to reduce the loans, but sometimes there's uh, some of my clients are quite environmentally uh, sensitive. Uh, so uh, in this case, the, the loan is, is limited to probably less than 80 meters square meter and the garden is dominated by plantings. Uh, so this is a rendering, a section uh, of, the, of the slow plantings. And this is uh, one of the first phase during the planting where we divided in strips the planted area uh, with, with strings in order to, to realize that the, the density, about the density so this garden is characterized by these beautiful multi-stem wild olive trees that were there already as this species is not really available on the market and there's some shaded area and uh, this is a in some perennials of course this is a common gabra and especially in the freshest part in the in the more in the fresh part of the garden so this is a sage and some other perennials. This is a South African uh, grass, Melinis. That's a view from the highest part of the garden. Mm. And you can see there are different sections here. The, the, the most marginal part is, is, a, is a dry garden where the flowers are not appearing during the summertime. And so you can see Hallims, it's a local species. Uh, well, actually it's, it's from uh, Sardinia and as well you can find in Tuscan as well. In this picture, you can see that the loan is dormant and the, the flowering is starting because it's early spring. There's some uh, local species like uh, endemic Alphodelus fistulosus. So this is an example of summer appearance with a texture contrast and the loan is now actively growing. So it's, it's quite green. And this part is only uh, decorative in terms of texture. And here is, is a the beginning of the summer, so Elicrasum is starting to flower, and Allium, Allium commutatum is in full flower. So that's another garden, uh, look, not far, it's always in the east coast. That's uh, an old town, quite uh, was quite remained original, uh, was quite protected from uh, Arabs, uh, Arab pirates during the 1700s, so the people used to be protected. And, and the environment is still pretty pristine, so now the, um, uh, the estate has quite a high value, uh, as normally uh, there's lots of uh, construction as well in the countryside, which the, make the prices not, not as high. So this is a, a 
the, the building are built in in the stazzo style, which is the the typical farm like the like the one I showed you before. And uh, you can see there are uh, although the, these are brand new houses, although they imitate the, stru the structure of the stazzo of the farm. And uh, you can see there is a few loans, uh, quite limited. This one was was actually stripped, and uh, and we we plant we have a planting instead. And there are uh, some olive groves, uh, which is an interesting production as well for, for someone who, who passed the holidays here. And it, it's quite pleased to have his own oil. Uh, this is a rendering of the main slope, which employs uh, quite xeric species. And the garden was planned with thyme, so it had the possibility to grow the plant in, in small sizes, which is not normally not available in the Italian market. You can usually find big plants, which are really hard to establish, especially during the summertime. Mm. I'm now using instead the, the pots for the forestry pots, which are even more effective in, in the establishment, which are taller with more, more roots and less canopy. These are the early phases during the planting, and uh, we we also we used to, to realize a little basin around the plant to water initially by hand, and then there's a watering there's a uh, subirrigation system uh, which we use quite responsibly. Uh, so one part of the garden is quite deep, and we had to use boulder uh, that we we could obtain from the same property. To, to contain the, the, the earth, the soil, actually. Uh, so this is actually, during the first season, the plants were quite happy, although we planted in, uh, in June, uh, but we, they, they grew quite happily during the first season. And this is at the second, uh, this, the second spring, and uh, so actually it's a two years old garden in this picture. Uh, this picture was taken in June, so you can see, see the lavandula dentata flowering, as well Lomalosia critica. This one is in the third season, but always in the same period. There's some sisters flowering as well. And this one is, is in full summer. Uh, where you can see the Perovskia flowering, mainly the color is done by per is, is given by Perovskia. That's a sculpture from uh, uh, Harbor. And uh, the, the planting style is here is more uh, uh, matrix planting in which the rosemary dominates with convolvulus. Uh, uh, and uh, here is more of a group planting where different groups contrast. Uh, sorry, Mark, can you just repeat that? So matrix and? Uh, yeah, matrix and group group planting. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. So in, in a matrix, there's a like a, like one of two species dominating the, uh, the planting and then in between something uh, creates more interest and variety. In this picture is, is not, isn't not uh, visible much more. So this other is, a, it's a planter on, on the upper side and it's quite a simple scheme where a few species are flowering, some Tobagia and some Lomelosia. And uh, there's some uh, structure which is given by wild olive trees pruned, you can see better here. And I like this, which create a contrast with the, with the countryside, with because you have the uh, cut, uh, the, the field where hay was cut. And uh, uh, there's this green yellow contrast, which is, recall, is recalled as well in the planting. That's another view of the same spot. Uh, that's a, a low planter which frame a bit the, the main planting where I, I've used the Filano di Flora or Lipia, which is a lone alternative, 
and uh, and I added as well some dwarf tulbagia, which might be more interesting. That's another view of the, of the group planting. And that's a picture from the winter where you can still still quite uh, a texture contrast with, which keep it interesting. Although in, in, in Mediterranean, it's quite easy to have uh, some winter flowering. Uh, in this case, I had no interest because the client normally uses the, the houses, uses the houses only in the, in the summertime, which is sometimes is, is a bit of a limit. And that's the northern area. That's the other lawn with some sages with summer summer flowering season. The Canariensis, and, and this is a South African species. This uh, that's a hybrid of a wild one. Okay, that's another section which I named. This is an, is a dialect name actually. It means the like the the, the abandoned vineyard. So it's like. Uh, it's, it's not, of course, a real vineyard, but it imitates like the abandonment of a vineyard where the plants grow in between the rows and the rows are interrupted. So that's the aspect of the, of the second year. And there's many um, xeric species and uh, some, also some, some uh, ground cover. In as well, there's some bare spot, which is 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 a bit uh, something that I've researched uh, to to obtain, uh, because in imitating this this kind of situation, that's a wild olive tree, which is natural. That's a planted one instead. And this is an imitate as well the, the situation in. Uh, in small vineyards, the popular one where, uh, while well, it's called consociazione, where you have fruit trees between the vines, and uh, is 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 actually the the possibility to obtain more production from from your property. So that, that's a lower part we planted recently instead of the loan, where we we could plant more basher species. These are uh, cupids dark catananke. Uh, there's as well Melinis and Vigumis, and there's some Tulbagia, and here there's as well some South African geophytes I'm testing, of which I have, I have no photos now. That's the entrance of the property, uh, where we could add sand, having to uh, lift the level uh, of, the, of the soil respect to the, the entrance road. Hadding sand was quite useful in order to control uh, wheat. So uh, this is like a perennial meadow uh, I conceived, and uh, there are is like is as well a matrix uh, planting where steepa dominates. Uh, there's some emergent species which I'll show better in later pictures, and this is Berkeya purpurea. It's a species. It's a four. Uh, from Africa, South African grassland from, uh, uh, is actually a species from uh, uh, summer rain area, but it, it's quite used as well in South Africa in, in, the, in the Mediterranean part. So you can see here layers backed better. Uh, so this is a restio actually, it's quite a tall one, it is a legio elefantina. Uh, that's uh, Sclepias speciosissima, uh, which should grow much higher in flower as well. And that's a Limonium peridi, is a Limonium from Canary Islands, a shorter one in the bottom layer. And, uh, and that's a sage, like the one I showed you before. And so you can see here, there's drift with uh, this Solanacea and Irembergia which is a species from Central America. And then you can see the, uh, the emergent layer like the Salvia, Camelenia, and uh, for example, the Restios, the Elegia. So some, some plants like the, the Nirenberger are, are planted in drifts to create color drifts, which are most visible here. 
Okay. Uh, regarding, I'd like to spend some some words about about the loans. So we often the the request from client is about loan. Uh, there's it's always uh, important. And so we, what I used to propose is the use of uh, macrothermic grasses, especially paspalum and as well zoesia. So these species, they normally require the half uh, of the water respect to the other species. And they don't suffer from, uh, normally from uh, disease, from fungal disease. And uh, as well with low cut, it's possible to control the, the weeds. So, uh, it's totally, um, could be sometime a totally organic uh, management of these loans, which is an advantage for, for clients or the clients are quite uh, interested in this aspect. And sometimes we, we can also use loan alternatives like sedges or the fila as well, as you've seen in one of the previous picture. So, uh, and I think it's important to as well define irrigation, the irrigation aspect, because irrigation in Mediterranean is not always accepted. Now, now the concept of a dry garden has become prominent, but uh, uh, I consider even in, in a dry garden option, irrigation as a, as a, a fundamental and crucial tool in, in uh, especially during the, the establishment and as well, xeric species sometimes they can uh, have they can have advantage from uh, irrig summer irrigation uh, of uh, that must be very calibrated, very uh, seldom. Otherwise, irrigation could be also like a, uh, a self defeated <laughs> defeating weapons uh, because normally a lot of Mediterranean species they don't tolerate uh, the summer irrigation, but. Uh, uh, in late, later season, the extreme temperature, and uh, they, they, they made a useful tool in this sense. Uh, we, I normally uh, suggest and, and plan a uh, dripping irrigation system in this way. This is an ongoing work where we, we will cover the, the drip lines with, uh, and, and the old planting with gravel, which uh, simplify in terms of the, the management in terms of more in terms of uh, uh, weeding and weed control. And, uh, and as well, the, the, of course, the pipes are not feasible. Otherwise, they could be completely buried eventually with machineries. And in this case, we well, also covering with mulch, with mineral mulch, there's a, a real water saving because of uh, the, the evaporation from soil surface is uh, practically excluded so the the only only the transpiration by the plant it, uh, is it the actual consumption water consumption and uh, furthermore uh, it's actually the, the mean to 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 drive the 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 root system uh, in the in the deepest layer so in this way the plant are actually more uh, rapidly set uh, and and so they, they, they could survive from, uh, with mo much more probability to severe drought. Um, this is an example of a, a overhead system in a loan where, where the, the, the sprinkler are excluding the trunk of the plant, which is an, a very important aspect because for uh, fungal disease predisposition, this should be totally avoided to, to, to wet the, the, the soil base, the, the, the stem base, the, the trunk base. And these kind of sprinklers are, uh, they could save a lot of water because there's a much less drift for wind action because uh, the drop are, are much bigger, but uniformly distributed anyway. So in California, these kind of sprinklers, they are promoted by the government. They give you actually, uh, by one part of the forage sprinkler. So in, uh, in my career, I've always tried to, to convince my clients and, and trying to plant, uh, to have a naturalistic planting in the garden uh, instead of a, just of a loan. And this is a quite hard uh, 
challenge because especially with touristic houses, residential uh, garden, uh, the, the use is exclusively, is, is restricted to summertime where the, the flowering is normally uh, reduced, especially for late summer. Um, so the, the, uh, the concept uh, of dry gardening itself has this limit and, and so well, some is often untidy during the, the, the summertime. So promoting the, uh, the naturalistic garden design uh, pl planting in, in, uh, in Mediterranean is quite, is quite an art issue, a uh, uh, hard challenge, a difficult challenge. Uh, so I always had, I try to uh, solve this kind of uh, limit of restriction to overtake this kind of, of restriction and uh, and find new species a new scheme depending of a uh, client sensibility uh, and as well from the availability of water because sometimes the client uh, in a, in countryside property they don't have water they have to buy water sometimes so it's extremely expensive to have a loan. Uh, so, uh, having this objective, I consider all, always consider the, the, the branch of uh, environmental horticulture, which is promoted mainly by the University of Sheffield, to be really interesting and uh, able to solve this, sometimes to solve this kind of, of issues, because many species, they, they also from Mediterranean climates and uh, also typically xeric species like in South Africa, they could uh, accept, they could tolerate irrigation. And so the study of this kind, this type of plant communities could be uh, really interesting in this sense. This is a, uh, the border, Merton border in Oxford Botanical Garden uh, by James Ichmo, which uses a lot of Mediterranean species, uh, although not really xeric one, but of course this is a already a uh, really resilient planting for, for England. Uh, but I always have to doubt to uh, the, the, the objective to reproduce something similar for uh, Mediterranean, properly Mediterranean environment. And uh, I had the chance to, to meet personally James Hitchmo, uh, which who proposed me a PhD project that uh, uh, started from this concept and this project was, uh, was held in Melbourne about in 2015. And at the moment, there's still some ongoing project, research project. You can find uh, with this link some interesting news about. And this project is based, as the name says, on a woody species of on a, uh, native Australian shrubs. And these should have the characteristic which is uh, an ecological uh, behavior in reacting special to what is called disturbance, which could be uh, fire or, or man action in cutting or herbivorous actions as well. And uh, so they, they could react to this disturbance with, by resprouting. Uh, so the resprouting species are mainly, but not exclusively, uh, typical of fire prone ecosystem like the Australia, uh, Australian Mediterranean part is, and but all, all the Mediterranean climates in the world, like uh, the proper Mediterranean climates, California and uh, South Africa and Chile. Uh, so fire is that important for these species that they could be like fire dependent in trying to replicate themselves. So the, the, the sea germinates only if fire happens. And uh, uh, otherwise, the in, for the resprouters, there's an obvious advantage because they regenerate a new canopy, which is more uh, able to flower and, and have a new foliage and, and renovate actually this canopy after fire, if the fire has, doesn't exceed a certain intensity. So the, the, these woody species, they are normally able to withstand drought more than uh, than uh, a basher species and these are the main character of this, stu this study so the these in this study uh, quite a high number of species was studied and any behavior after 
after the copy sync operation, which is the main maintenance protocol, is a simplified maintenance that allows to maintain even big surface as could be done even with machineries. <coughs> so this is the concept of my own project, which I, I, I developed with a supervision of James Hitchmout. I called to simplify it, the mosaic meadow, uh, although I, I don't think James <laughs> really likes this, but really simplify a really long, long uh, title. So instead of using only uh, uh, woody species, in this case, uh, we, should, we will use uh, herbaceous and subfrutescent species, which is to say semi herbaceous, like for example, PB lavender, was a herbaceous growth, growth over a uh, woody base. Uh, so the, the, this is called um, mosaic meadow because it, it is inspired by the concept of mosaic landscape, which could be referred to the general aspect of uh, Mediterranean landscape, not only in Mediterranean, but it's quite typical of Mediterranean. And is as well referred to the single vegetation units where there's many layers that could coexist if there's a disturbance cyclically, cyclically repeated. So this is the, the, the section I designed, I drew, I drew. And so you can see some low species in the bottom layer, which are the stress tolerated like uh, some teucrium or some few lavenders are able to do that. Some herbaceous species, there's geophytes, and then there's some higher, some taller sub shrubs. And there's, there's few shrubs that could work as point of interest, like structure of planting. And uh, the, the, the objective is as well to limit the, these shrub expansions, which could be, uh, could be detrimental in terms of, the, of the, the planting appearance, because what happens usually in, in, a, in, the cycle, in the cycle of fire prone ecosystem is that the biodiversity in the year after fire is reduced and uh, tend to be reduced because of the shrub expansions. Mm. So this is an example of a resprouting plant. It's a small erica. This is a picture I took in, in uh, close to Stellenbosch and uh, they were flowering after the first year. So they were creating a very nice bottom layer, base layer. So this is a not really nice picture of an ecosystem uh, post fire situation. That's a, that's a peninsula in Sardinia, uh, which is a very nice place in Northern Sardinia. It's a limestone peninsula. And there's a, an emerging layer, layer, which is done by uh, actually a paraphyte, which is Ampelodesmus mauritanicus, this tall emergent grass. And then you can see that at the same time, there are stress tolerators plant in the groups of uh, small genista, helichrysum, and as well some germander. And there's as well these uh, sisters that dry, dry, dried out during the summertime that gives this messy aspect. But it, ecological is quite an interesting picture. And that's another example of mosaic where there's a lot of uh, grasses in a, more, in a more productive soil. It's more or less the same place in Northern Sardinia. And uh, I think it's quite interesting to see uh, this structure of uh, grassland alternated with uh, uh, scrubland. And of course, this is much more attractive. That's on the table mountain in South Africa and is in the second, third year after fire where you still can see a lot of geophytes flowering and, and as well as some re-sprouts are flowering at the same time. And uh, these happen until the, the, all the re-sprouters, they, they don't shade uh, the, the, the geophytes, which actually tend to go dormant after up to 80% of them after the second or third year. So that's, that's the scheme of the planting uh, is quite a big plot. So we still have to plant. Actually, I'm actually propagating at the moment the plant. So you can see there's a, 
uh, some plot is irrigated, some other is not to see the difference. And there's two community types. So one is exclusively Mediterranean and one uh, include as well species from uh, South Africa and, and Australia to see if they, the, the performance of the planting is actually different uh, associated with irrigation or not. And you both are copies actually, or not copies to see the difference in, in the behavior. So these are the, my drawings for the, for the two community types. Okay, now I'll show you some of the species how we use in the project and some of the species we use normally uh, in my planting uh, uh, design. These are really interesting species from, from uh, South Africa, from actually a few plateau uh, as a fragmented distribution in South Africa and as a very abundant flowering uh, is not I can't explain why South African nursery, they, can't, they don't produce this one. This picture is actually from Annie's Annual, which is a nursery from, uh, I think, from San Francisco, from Northern California. And it's, it's quite an amazing species. And it's able to tolerate really harsh conditions. Uh, I'll show you later some picture. Um, that's another interesting species with late flowering in, the, in, a, in South Africa. It's a Watsonia, uh, which is not cultivated as well, and, and it flowers in our August, which is there February. That's a cultivation. These are the pots I was talking to you about, the, the, which were actually registered by Olivier Filippi, they are produced in Italy. And that's the environment where this species was growing. You can see it grows actually in some time in, uh, in cracks, in stone cracks. This is a uh, road verges without, without almost any so. That's another inter very interesting species. Uh, the picture is from James Hitchmo, and that's a post fire succession. You can see the burn stems as, uh, are still visible. And uh, is in the family of uh, kangaroo po, which is much more popular species, Anigozantos from Australia. And, but this species, Dilatris, is unique of, of the Cape, Cape Floral Kingdom. This one is from probably from a mountain area, but this one is from uh, the Cape Peninsula, the Cape of Good Hope, and is really interesting. This is, was the end of the flowering, but you, you can see this small color, I think is fantastic. And uh, you can see there's a lot of flowering stem flowers them for each bunch. Really? So sometimes even 15 big, big flowers. And this plant was actually noticed by the settlers and, and the botanists uh, the, of the company. They used to, to travel with the company of Indus. That's a propagation um, in 2017. So about, so now, uh, I'll come back to Sardinia to coastal environment. I'll show you some plants we use in to, to, to try to plant in this type of context where uh, the onshore wind is very common. Uh, Sardinia was known for, for the maestrale wind, which is quite common as well in France. But you can imagine the amount of salt that could reach this, these gardens in the shore. So this species is very interesting. It's now available in quite like three, four varieties. And it's, it's common salt marshes in Sardinia is located only in one spot on the East Coast. Uh, this is probably another ecotype. It's very interesting with summer flowering, full summer flowering. That's a biome, a plant association in, in an offshore, in, in a spot of Sardinia, where Armeria pungens is an endemic species. It's very amazing flowering. It's like a super bloom almost. It's like a dune of five kilometers. And, and I used to plant this plant often, while this helichrysum is quite common also in a herb, uh, Herb industry, like the I think Leoxitan, the, the the big group uh, use helichrysum oil, which was used in uh, Sardinian tradition for especially for skin treatment. 
Philly catechoides is a species typical of South Africa with long flowering season almost year round. And uh, it's quite useful to plant it, it almost exactly on the shore or at least in the second row. There's a planting example from an old garden that's uh, a common species of the, of the of the dune grass, Amophila uh, arenaria. Uh, this is a Erodion corsicum, is, a, is an endemic species, and you could find it all over the coast, I think even in Tuscany, although in, and in Corsica, of course, and is able actually to, to flower continuously during the summertime if watered very seldom. Magidaris pastinacea, it's uh, is in the Apiace family, I think is a very interesting species. You can see with ferula behind the, the, the seed, the flower head are very, very big. And so associated with shrubs is uh, shrub in between shrub groups is quite interesting species. Ediogonium uh, are the buckwits. These are Californian species. I propagated by seed. You can buy online seeds and uh, some of them are quite drought tolerant, and many of them are salt tolerant as well for use on the shores. This is really interesting one, is Eriogonium giganteum. It's quite a tall one, like one meter and a half, and the seed head and the, and the flower head, the dry flower head are very interesting as, as well. So thanks for listening. That's, uh, <laughs> A picture from Kiev, hoping for to be for peace. It was taken a long time ago, like uh, I think in 2015. Is the open air museum, which was is really amazing. Mm. Okay, thank you very much, Marco. Right. Wonderful selection of um, plants for us to consider. Um, I just wonder how resistant some of them are to cold. Oh, well, many of them they can tolerate. Cold. What are your temperatures in the water? The, sorry? Um, can I ask you just to then maybe shut your screen so we can all go into yeah. gallery? I'm trying to, okay, okay, one second. I can't understand. Can you see me now? Yes, oh, we see you, but we also see the, the very, screen. Um, nice photo, hoping for peace. No, I can't okay. understand. Well, don't worry, I... leave it there, leave it there. I mean, it, it, yeah, I don't know if I can stop you. Maybe I can stop you by, um, <laughs> uh, let's see, one participant can share at a time. So mm, nothing has happened to mine. Um, Okay, sorry. There you oh. go. There you go. Well done. Was easy. Fantastic, wonderful, um, wonderful uh, photos of these beautiful plantings in gardens and obviously in the experimental um, um, situation. And obviously, okay. my question to you to start us off was how how resistant are some of those plants? Because when they're coming in from Australia and South Africa, often we we can't use them on the mainland because we've got yeah actually many of them they are resistant they they can tolerate frost there's there's quite a lot of literature about because many of the species were used in uh, in northern england even in northern england like yeah. the uh, aristea inequalis is quite tolerant because you, you, you can think in in Munchuk mountains uh it snows every year uh -huh. so many of them they can tolerate frost uh, except the coastal one I was showing you, of course, like, like the Limonium peridino is normally at a lot of scorches at the end of the summer, uh, the, of the winter as well in Sardinia, but uh, uh, there's quite, it's quite a good number. Like Watsonia for sure, many Watsonia, um, and I can't, can't re remember exactly because it is, it's not something I, I'm not used to, I'm used to consider because I normally plant in coastal areas where we have moderate frost like occasion very occasionally minus one not okay. not right. more mm. 
Okay, so I had another question, if I may, if, if anybody would now like to put their hand up, um, pressing the raise hand, um, we can go with questions, or if there's anything on the chat. Yeah, I think there's three. There's three. There uh, are three. Yellow okay. flower, first slide. I think was a, where the tower was, it was a ferula communis. In my first slide, uh, there was a nurage, the, the megalithic tower, that was a ferula communis. Yeah, that's exactly. Mm -hmm. A Sardinian producer of plants. Actually, there's a nursery which is specialized in uh, native plant. It's mm -hmm. called Vivai Murja. I'll, I'll write you the number down. But, he, he has not the same collection as before, but he still has something interesting. And does he does he does he ship? Yeah, he, he might ship. Yeah, yeah. They could be interested, of course. Mm -hmm. They do plan for uh, forestry. How do you say forestal use? Uh, forestation, but they, they produce specifically Sardinian one. Actually, they could be allowed to sell the. Centaurea orrida, which is forbidden, because they they own it. They they are reproducing and propagating it before the law was was. Okay. Was, mm. uh -huh. okay. So, in your grass selection, may I mm. ask you then, which you know, I'm I was in love with those mixed group plantings in the second. Um, garden oh, okay. uh, because I've steered away with grasses I don't know what to do with them so which I saw obviously Stipa tenuissimum there was a yeah. South African grass which was very beautiful with pinkish and I don't oh, think yeah, that's, that's one right. that's uh, Melinis nerviglumis how, how do you say that please or maybe uh, you write it on the yeah. right. <laughs> so yeah. that one is used as an annual actually even in England I think this is the spell Link mirror, no, mirror. and but normally, uh, resprout every year, so it's, it's like a warm season grass, it's a macrotomy grass. So, so normally, you vegetate during the, the full summer, okay. and so you need to cut it quite late and and resprout res and, and actually self seed a lot. Oh. So it's quite it's quite an interesting one, you, yeah. you can. I'm planning as well to use it as a main species, like in, uh, in matrix planting sometime. Okay. Yeah. And oh, I tolerate as well the shade, mm. which is oh. quite uncommon. I'm always in trouble when I have too much shade. So in half shade is a, is a really interesting species. Hmm. Okay, so there it is, Melanesis. Mel and actually we use a lot uh, a, a species which is common on rod verges and it's common as well to South Africa. Uh, flora and is Iparrenia irta. Uh, this one is really drought tolerant. And I'm as well trying to make a selection because you can find fine leaves one and and a coarser one. Uh, so it's very it's very interesting species. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm. Okay, so I see Rosie. Rosie has asked a question, and Michael would like to answer ask a question. So Rosie wants to, uh, can you read that for me, Yvonne, please? Or Rosie, come yeah, online. Just, just coming. Um, um, Rosie would like, please, to talk more about planting fewer plants. Mm -hmm. And in planting fewer plants, how do you determine the spacing? Um, well, actually, <laughs> Sometimes we plant fewer plants. Well, it, the concept of planting fewer plants could be uh, referred to, to planting the, uh, the re-sprouting shrubs because uh, they will uh, expand. Uh, so so you, those one actually, they could be planted with a lower density, uh, but uh, the concept is more about if you use uh, the 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 resprout species resprouting species you you might need to don't to not replace many species in the future so 
because uh, they are long-lived species, uh, uh, which is quite a difference, an important difference respect to the, for example, many receders like lavenders or many hybrids, uh, especially even, even worse with, with the hybrid species. Uh, but the, the, all the, the re-sprouters, they have normal lignin tubers or reserve organs, they can re-sprout from. And this is a really uh, big difference in terms of uh, longevity of the planting. So it's always an issue. In my opinion, uh, what I found quite disturbing and disappointing is to, to replace planting in an already mature planting. Uh, replace plant is quite difficult because you have a lot of plant competition for uh, at root level then as well that uh, uh, for light and, and it's quite it's quite a big problem. Interesting. Mm. Okay Michael would you like to go now thanks? Yeah thanks. Uh, Marco at one point you started talking about uh, your matrix planning versus group planting and I just wanted to know if if this for you is it purely an aesthetic choice or what does it have to do with the land also that you're working on when you when you decide which of these two to follow? And if I can ask a second question that, that I think is related in when you were talking about your design for you, you called it in English the abandoned vineyard, I think it was. There are areas where you can still see dirt in between the plants, and, and you yeah. said you've done this intentionally, but there was something particularly you've done that I didn't catch, maybe. If, if you could tell us a little bit more about that. Thanks. Uh, okay, the first question was about, uh, remind, could you remind me the first question what was about? So the first question was when you talked uh, about matrix, yeah. planting, no, is it just actually, aesthetic or? Yeah, it's actually a concept with, that you could find in uh, Noel Kingsbury books. And uh, uh, actually the, the matrix and it is referred actually to pit out of planting, but it's a concept that could be applied, applied of course, in every environment. And uh, it, it's purely aesthetic and, and the matrix planting actually reproduce more a community and the effect you can see uh, looking at native at, at spontaneous flora uh, but uh, uh, in group planting of course is 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 a um, it's a pure uh, imitation we, we do but is clearly less less uh, similar to what we could see in nature and uh, anyway the the, the difference it, uh, bet between uh, the chef and school is is an uh, the, the plant th these type of planting are not similar. Well, at first look they could look similar to matrix, but uh, uh, they are very much more random. So, uh, well, actually, there's a study of proportions between the species, but uh, they are. Planted in a, in a with, with this uh, proportion, but in a really random way. Uh, so th these are more. Uh, there's much more uh, knowledge behind, and, and and in this in in while in a uh, in a matrix planting like the one I show you is more aesthetic. So um, I, I still planted in layers, but. Uh, um, it, it, it's more taken from uh, from the uh, from the King's, Kingsbury book, book, so it's, it was more aesthetic actually. So, so aesthetically, it was an imitation more closer to nature, but uh, there, there wasn't yet a study like like a popular uh, community study like like the Chef and School does, like it is in, instead in my project. And then in the vineyard, then in the fake. Ah, and the vineyard, yeah, by the vineyard. Uh, no, what, what actually what it was uh, um, was done with purpose. So, like to imitate the uh, the new colonization of, of a land, of an abandoned land that, that normally was, was tilled, uh, but late, later it's not anymore. So, the, 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 there's always a sparse growth. And you can see the bare spot normally. And does that not fill up immediately with weeds? No, well, they, they, 
we have, of course, more weed problem, of course. But normally, if you don't, if you use gravel, you can avoid that. You can see in Philippi's planting, there's normally uh, with purpose many many bare spots. But with the gravel, you you avoid the the weed management problems. And 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 in Philippi's planting, there's an allelopathic study as well. For many species, they are uh, they reject the the, the germination of many of many weeds, actually, like Flomis, for example, there are some sisters probably. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, so next up is um, Lucas. Hello, Lucas. It's good to see you. <laughs> hey, everyone. Hey, um, I was curious about the gravel specifically, um, how thick you put gravel down, gravel mulch. Um, I've always been curious about using gravel mulch. Um, you also mentioned that it prevents evaporation from the soil and then it's only evapotranspiration from the plants yeah uh, that sounds pretty cool mm -hmm. yeah it, it actually it works in uh, in continental climates as in uh, in mediterranean climates and uh, we we use quite a thick layer a thick layer is effective otherwise a thin layer are not uh, so at least six seven centimeters and sometime uh, we should plant a, a bit uh, a bit out of level uh, creating a basin uh, on uh, uh, which is a bit um, elevated to, to the to the original level uh, and the and, the, and the, the plant base must be uh, covered with uh, with the gravel uh, so that's a technique which is hard to apply sometimes if you're late in the season uh, otherwise, you shouldn't cover exactly the, the stem base uh, uh, too much, of course. Uh, but it, the, the use of gravel is as well interesting because sometimes you can have germination of uh, self germination of many species of the plant in itself. So you have a renovating process in, in the same planting, especially if you use uh, medium or uh, low size uh, low size granules like. Uh, three, four millimeters, we call it rizone, like rice in, in, in Italy, in the in Italian market. Or, or the, there's a, what we call granella, which reaches about one centimeter. And there's a, as well a fraction of smaller one. So you can have actually germination. So I, I know Alejandro Neil from uh, South of Spain who collaborates with James Basson. They did as well some seeding, some sowing on uh, actually on, on that gravel and, and has worked as well. So. It's, it's very interesting. And many species actually are dependent from uh, uh, in the germination, like cystus, they need to, the, the seeds are in touch with the, with the stones because the high temperatures, they make the seed germinate with higher rate. Otherwise the, the, the cystus doesn't germinate like for 10, probably 15%. In this way, they, they germinate like to, up to 78%. Yeah, I've noticed here um, a lot of the California natives also, they germinate in the gravel pathway, but mm -hmm. not in the soil areas. They, they yeah. like the gravel. That's very interesting, yeah. Okay, thank you. And Paul, Paula, hello. You're, can you unmute, Paula? My question was about the time of planting, Marco. I'm mm -hmm. in Western Australia. And normally here, you talked about spring, but here we wouldn't plant in spring because the plant would not survive the summer. So normally we would plant in autumn. So I'm waiting now to get ready to plant in April. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah. No, well, we, we can, I, you have other question? Oh, yeah. Can yeah, the, my question is, would you normally plant in spring? Uh, is that the best time to plant in Sardinia? No, no, actually, ideally, we should plant in September, but uh, it's something okay. that normally doesn't happen for many reasons. And because okay. the client date on program, what, what actually happens is to plant from uh, also winter time. We plant often in, during winter time. And it's quite as effective uh, as, uh, as as autumn, but September, of course, made a big difference because the plant they they can face the winter. We don't really uh, establish fruit, and, and they 
and they have like a more hard growth, more lignified growth. And uh, so they, they can face the winter and they can start with, a, with much more growing energy during the uh, during March from well actually they they, they start to vegetate now so February uh, with this mild winter winter we are we are having recently mm. but they move roots actually during the winter time depending on the species but mainly they, they grow in winter time and uh, of course uh, as contractor and uh, you often have to plant even in full summer, but you need to assist a lot to plant with manual watering and very, very closely. So it is, of course, something to avoid, but commercially, you often have to do that. Okay. But ideally, planting in September is the, in our September, which is your April, of course. Yes, of course. Thank you. Okay. Right. Patty, hello. Hi, Patty. Hi. <clears throat> Um, I was just curious about um, if you come across problems of like invasive species, you know, considering important plants from, from South Africa or other countries. Um, I live in Italy, but um, a lot of my clients are in California. And uh, as Lucas probably knows, um, invasive species are a great problem in California and the government regulates um, a lot of what you can import and you can't import. And I'm just curious that if you come across this problem, I'm also curious if the Sardinian government can tries to control some of this. Yeah, the Italian government, actually European government has made laws recently for the control of certain invasive, like uh, Penisitum cetacium, and which is invasive in South Africa itself. And, uh, but there's no one who may, who actually is, because I, I, I tried to report the use of these species because it, it, like, for example, Sicily, completely invaded by Penicetum cetaceum. And uh, there's many papers about, and, uh, but it, it, no one makes respect this law, so it's very bad. And in, in many nurseries, they still produce Penicetum cetaceum, like Carpodobrotus also, the creeping uh, succulent from South Africa. And, and it's forbidden actually. So, but it's very important, it's up to us to, to be uh, conscious in this sense and avoid the propagation of invasive species. Many, many grasses especially are invasive, but uh, mm -hmm. for many South African species, it's, it's quite a problem to propagate instead of that they are invasiveness. But of course we need to be, uh, to be conscious, which could be a, a really big problem. And Sipas himself is not very invasive here, uh, but I'm trying to avoid it in recent plantings because it's quite common and, and, and is a bit invasive, but not too much, not like, like for example, this pen is eaten. And uh, yeah. Um, okay, thank you. Caroline Norris. Yeah, I, um, she kind of asked my question, except mine is more specific. It's really regarding a specific grass you, you seem to use a lot of, which is the steep attenuissima. And here in Southern California, it's become extremely invasive and I have found it in my own use to be very much so. And was curious as to if you have found it that way in Sardinia. And by the way, on her point about California regulations, they're really, they're uneven. Um, they'll make regulations across the board for something that is invasive in Northern California and Southern California. It's, it's not an issue like artichokes. That's usually both, mostly just in the dunes by the beach. So even though we're heavily regulated, it's not wisely so all the time. But anyway, about that particular grass, Steepa, do you have an issue with it? Because I can tell you here, it is severely invasive and it has gotten into the mountains and they know that now it's out of control. No, here it's not really out of control. I mean, you can still find okay. some. You, you can also find some gauras as well, but okay. it's not very, really out of control. You can have a moderate uh, expansion, but not, uh, not widely in the countryside. So sometime around the garden, you can find some. Sorry, Angela, what, which grass are you talking about now? Uh, Stipa. Stipa tenuissima. Stipa, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, it, it seems very readily and takes like that. I mean, if you want to steep a garden, just put one in. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Yeah. Okay, Thank you. Caroline. Yvonne? Yeah, I, I just want to, uh, one or two things are just coming on the chat. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm conscious that I'm not keeping up to, to, to speed with that. Um, um, could I just ask, um, uh, oh, uh, one person has said that, um, uh, sorry, so one person was um, uh, wishing uh, peaceful gardens to continue to grow uh, very much in sympathy with your very final slide. And I think we would all echo that. Um, uh, but uh, somebody's uh, now Maria Eva Giorgione has asked, have you published the results of your trials? Because we know you're doing the research. Is it you're asking to Eva Giorgioni? Or you're asking, sorry. No, you're asking, um, Eva Giorgioni is asking to you, have you published your research? Uh, yeah. No, no, sorry. No, I. I I wasn't clear about the, I'm just at the beginning. I, I, I'm propagating actually the plants, which is a quite a long process. So as the second, uh, second autumn when I'm, I'm propagating, uh, so it will take time. So I have two more years. So it's quite a long, uh, it's quite a long study because it takes two years of establishment. And then the cycle, the coppicing cycles, are every two years. So I, I might be uh, investigating about two cycles and, and see the different, or possibly a third one. But it's, it's useful the fact that it's a part-time study, a part-time PhD, because I can see a, a longer cycle, which is not possible to see, for example, in a three years, three years one. So I might be publishing uh, possibly about irrigation uh, during the study, uh, but uh, the, the, this would, would happen during about four years or three years, yeah, to cycle, to, to copy scene cycles, so, which is the main operation to, that, to do. So that's when you're coming back to talk to us then? Yeah, sure. <laughs> 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 okay, and, and there was some um, more, Yvonne, I think. Now, question has just come in again from Lucas saying, asking, does Sardinia have a, a lot of wildfires? Is it, is it a continual problem? Yeah, actually, the, the woodland is increasing all over the uh, Italy and probably all over the Europe because of land abandonment. And that's quite an issue. It's not always positive because it's, got, it's not going to change climate change direction. And, uh, and it's, it's the, the, really, the real downside is the unmanaged woodland that is growing because we don't have any more ungulates because they were extinct actually. We only have a few deers and few mufflons, wild sheep. Mm -hmm. And there's no more got, got uh, uh, husbandry all over the island, uh, which, which used to limit the, the uh, like the brambles and the and the and the woodland, the the understory woodland. Uh, so the, these type of unmanaged uh, mm -hmm. uh, woodland are mm -hmm. really dangerous because the the fire, not anymore renovating fires, but they are extremely dangerous fire. We had an example during the summertime, and lots of cities were threatened, and uh, and a huge forest. I don't remember was probably twenty thousand. Hectares was was destroyed, and with high intensity, we had flames of thirty meter flames. Were really shocking experience, and uh, and they are not probably resprouting anymore because the, the resprouters they can't stand a certain threshold of temperatures, and uh, so it's not it's not a, a, a renovating fire like the, the shepherds used to do, and, and it's it's a really tragic event, and. Uh, so the, the, the increasing amount of woodland is not any more uh, is not any more positive in this sense. So that there was a group of botanists, of academic botanists, they told they published a document telling not to uh, a forest the new land, but let let the nature grow itself and, and recover itself. So letting the same biodiversity uh, that happens usually after a fire 
and, and not you doing uh, terrible for station that were done normally tilling the soil and causing uh, erosion like happened in the, in the decades ago and introducing as well invasive species like eucalyptus. So this is probably wouldn't be done now, but uh, the process himself was, was, ne was considered negative by these academics. And I, I agree in a, certain, in a certain way with them. So it, it is, it is uh, very bad, the land abandonment in itself is a, it's a really bad uh, process at the moment all over the Europe. I also read a, a paper about this process happening in, uh, in Spain that where ecologists used to say, we have to introduce uh, the, some new ungulates that we have actually uh, natural ones. We have the, muff, the mufflon uh, population are, are growing and expanding. And uh, otherwise the, the, what grows uh, is not managed by, by the government, which, which could be anyway a huge, a huge cost, probably uh, not easy to face by any government. But uh, the, the thing is that the, the, the forestry resource is not planned. It's very bad. Mm. Okay, so here's another. Manos Bezanis has raised his hand. Hello, Manos. Hello, thank you. Uh, and thank you for your wonderful presentation. It was really uh, exciting to see all about uh, the uh, Mediterranean gardens in uh, Sardinia, amazing island. I would like to ask you a question regarding uh, the use of uh, native plants to Sardinia in your gardens and uh, especially the use of uh, native ecotypes. Do you collect seeds from nut populations and then uh, grow them or uh, some uh, professional growers are collecting uh, seeds from the nut native uh, Sardinian genotypes or do you source uh, the different species from uh, nurseries all over the, uh, Europe? Uh, well, thanks for the question, it's very interesting. Uh, I try actually to propagate myself and to collect the seeds in, in, in the environment. For example, certain species, like for example, the germander, uh, Teucrium marum, which is very scented, it's a very interesting species with a potential summer flowering cycle, and which is native. You can find it in coastal areas, like very close to the shore, and even at 1,000 meters, like in the picture I show you. I don't know if you remember, there was a picture, picture mountain gari, at 1,000 meters, but th that one is probably different in, term in genetical terms from the one you can find on the shore. Uh, so, well, not necessarily, because probably that one uh, could stand as well the same condition, but I'm not sure. So I'll, what I try to do is, is to collect uh, from, 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 from nature, which, which could make the difference. And then, and then from uh, simply, uh, observing you, you often can find interesting species perennial ones that could uh, uh, could flower in uh, with some have, like showing a summer interest which is not very common there's for example there's a tapsia a recent recently spotted and and is used in england for example there was in certain uh, like in surprise garden there was a tapsia uh, and is a plant here that grows in overgrazed pastures it grows in uh, uh, is actually a, um, pyrus, uh, uh, a species associated with fires often. And uh, that one is very interesting. And, and I'm trying to collect the seed, but it's very hard to propagate. M many are difficult to propagate. Yeah. But in the, the main example, for example, uh, by James Hitchman was the Quercus cochifera. You can find it in Greece, but you can find much more than uh, ecotype. So it's very interesting to select by nurseries. And, and it's something not really easy to find on the market, this, this, this type of, uh, of, production, of production. That's why I try to produce myself many species and try to use the forestry pots and knowing the, 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 the provenance of the, of, the, of the seed batch. Yeah. Okay, so Paula has just asked, do you use smoke water to propagate? Uh, yeah, yeah, of okay. course. Okay, uh, we do I, too. I, I use, well, I actually, I buy the discs, the, the primer discs from uh, South Africa. Otherwise, I, 
I know they are available in uh, Australian market. And otherwise, I smoke the seed. Um, yeah. But, yeah. But it is a small, more stable result, probably with a, with a, with a small quarter. Or can, you, can you describe that to somebody who doesn't? Yeah, the, the discs are the red discs, uh, paper red discs, which are imbibed with a substance, which is called, well, they are basically imbibed with the smoked water, but there's a substance that was discovered that is a compound finely smoke and was discovered in Kirstenbosch. And uh, this, this is actually the agent that uh, enabled the seeds to germinate, to make them feel that the fire uh, has passed and, and, the, 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 and the land is free to germinate and, and, and find the light. And find not, not many actually herbivores because the parasite is quite a problem during the, the cycles. Because when, when the, there's a lot of flower ongoing, flowering ongoing, there's many parasites of population that actually parasitize, parasitize the flower, the seeds, and so the plants are not able to, to germinate. So the, what, there's a seed bank that is ready to germinate from the first season after fire and, and uh, need to feel the fire and, and, the, and the substances associated with, with, with the smoke. To Germany. So practically speaking, what is it? You've got your pot. Ah, it's a disc. Then you you have to 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 put water and then let the seed uh, for twenty four hours oh. there. Okay. They become reddish. Yeah. And, and then you can. And then you put them into your your forestry pot. Yeah. No. And well. Then... No. I I put in trays. And um, I yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Sure. So it's it's quite a long long process with lot a lot of failure actually. Often, <laughs> depending on, as well on uh, on seed freshness, if they are young seeds or mm. or not, sometimes. Mm. Oh, fascinating, fascinating. So it's a, it's an it is a long process this research. So um, yeah, you know, as you go along, will we be able to? You know, how will we follow you in this endeavor? Yeah, I'll I'll keep. I actually need to publish to start posting about this on on Instagram. Okay. Uh, and uh, um, I, 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 it will be interesting seeing the communities growing as well. Uh, so I'm, I'm very curious, <laughs> curious about, and okay. uh, I'll, I'll keep posting that, of course. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, we will be following you. Um, Marco has a fantastic Instagram account it's at marco scano no at m dot scano oh sorry m dot scano yeah. okay yeah. forgive me <laughs> um and uh, i think there was uh, one last question from delia what how do you say smoke water in italiano ma non so <laughs> actually that's not because we don't we we don't need to do that in common practice no. uh, there's not an actual adjective to say smoked in italian Aqua fumata, but that doesn't sound right. Ti guardano come un pazzo, no? Okay. Um, I, I hope have we uh, have we have we addressed everybody on the chat. I don't turn the chat up because, of course, this is being recorded on my computer, so that's why I don't. I look like I don't know what's going on. But um, if anybody else has got anything to say, please raise your hand now. Otherwise, I think we'll say. Thank you so much for an interesting, Thanks you. interesting Thanks. presentation. Beautiful gardens, beautiful plant suggestions, all of them to some of us anyway, not very well known. So that's a lot of research that will be inspired by this. And I hope that you will join us for future sessions with the speakers to come. Oh yeah, sure. That'd and be stay, stay in touch lovely. with society and with um, all of us. Okay? My pleasure. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 I'll see you next week. Uh, next Thank month, you. we're going to um, where are we going? Chile. I think we're in in Chile next month. So ah, Chile. Yeah. 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 Bravo. Let's go. Bravo. Bravo. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank you.